Matthew chapter 27 this morning, if you'll find it with me. The Gospel of Matthew in the 27th chapter. We've for several years been studying the Gospel of Matthew on Sunday mornings. We had come to the crucifixion scene several months ago, I guess, and we spent about five or six weeks looking at the crucifixion. And then we stopped for a couple of weeks because of Corona and dealing with other subjects. Next Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday. And the next section, chapter 28, deals with uh, the resurrection, the burial and the resurrection. And so next Sunday, we'll examine that passage and then we'll look at the Great Commission. And hard to believe that in two weeks, we will be done with the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I timed it. I timed it to end up in Matthew 28 on the Easter Sunday, and it worked out just wonderful for me. And uh, I, um, I have enjoyed this book and uh, looking forward to the next book that we study. But Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Today is what the world calls Palm Sunday. If you follow the Catholic version of events, this is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey with people paving the way with palm branches. So this began what they call Holy Week or the week of the crucifixion. Now they believe that that happened on a Sunday because what happened is they, they believed that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. And so they counted backwards all of the days in between and they, they ended up on Sunday. So you have Palm Sunday. And my problem is, is that I started the resurrection on Sunday and I count all the days back and I don't end up with a Friday crucifixion and therefore I don't end up with a Palm Sunday. I end up with a Palm Friday or a Palm Saturday, depending on how you want to look at it. But nevertheless, nevertheless, um, you can recall all of the events that has brought us up to Calvary. We had the jealousy of the religious leaders that became a, a murderous hatred you have the throng of people that whip themselves into a frenzy demanding that Jesus be their king while at the same time religious elders are meeting in a secret chamber plotting, plotting his death. We followed the Lord as he met with his disciples that one last night in the upper room and, and then that final walk out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed as they slept and as he waited for Judas Iscariot to come and to give him that kiss of betrayal. The arrest in the garden brought him before Caiaphas, the high priest, at the Sanhedrin court for a series of sessions in that kangaroo court. After the most illegal trial in all of human history, he's taken to Pilate, hopefully to have the Romans to do the work of crucifixion or execution for them. And there you find he stands before Pilate, then to Herod, and then back to Pilate. Pilate finally consents and condemns Jesus to die. We looked at how that he was turned over to the Roman soldiers. He is scourged, he is mocked, he is ridiculed, he is beat upon, he is spit upon, and finally he is led out to Calvary. And sometime at nine o'clock in the morning, on a Wednesday morning, there they crucified him. For six hours, Jesus hung on that cross, three hours in the light, three hours in the darkness. From that cross come seven statements that we didn't Look at but seven statements that are full of truth and wonder, and now he is dead. It is three o'clock in the afternoon. Most of the crowd has dwindled away. The soldiers that were charged with the death are just standing around. They're waiting for further orders. There's a few women and a few followers that are still at a distance weeping and watching. And of course, as Christians, we understand the theological importance of what has just taken place. We understand the doctrine of the cross. We know that behind all of the ugly betrayal and tragedy of false accusations and unjust trials and unfair uh, condemnation, we, we know, we know that the Lord has just died for our sins. 
We know that what has happened is that God has just offered His own Son up as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. There's a song that has the line, this changes everything, and boy, how it ever does. And so we look at the cross as the greatest triumph, not the greatest tragedy. That's the Christian perspective to it. But now he is dead. Joseph will get permission to take his body down. He'll be buried in a borrowed tomb. And then we just wait for three days for the next great event in the history of the world, and that is the resurrection. Now, most of the world knows that story. There are probably very few people in America that has not heard the name Jesus Christ. Now, they don't know the gospel of it. They don't know the, they don't know the truth behind it. They don't know that, that he died for their sins. So, so there's a part of it that they don't know. But, but, but they do know the story. Everybody in America knows the story of the virgin birth because they've seen a, a manger scene in Walmart. And everybody at this time talks about a cross and an empty tomb and so that they know they know there is a story because they've seen a display somewhere. But but if you were to take this story, the gospel, if you were to take it to the streets and begin to tell the truth of it, what really, really happened, you would be met with different responses. You might but find somebody that is interested enough to listen to it but do nothing about it. You might but run into somebody that says, oh, that's a fairy tale. It didn't even happen. That There's no truth to that. Maybe, maybe somebody would hear it and would be convicted and would want to be saved, but would walk away. But the story is met. Every time that you pass out a gospel track, every time that you try to tell the story, it is met with a different response. It was that day and it is this day as well. Not everybody responded to the crucifixion of Christ the same way. And their responses as they watch him die, their responses mirror the same responses that men have today of the story of the cross. I give you four responses to Calvary. First of all, I want you to look at verse 54 at what I call the centurion's confession. Verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the Son of God. A centurion was an officer in the Roman army, had a hundred men under him. This particular centurion, we believe, was given the charge of the crucifixion and so it is his soldiers that have done all of the dastardly deeds that we read about in chapter 57. We don't know how much he knew, but we would assume that he would have known something about his prisoner. Maybe he would have been briefed on the situation. Here's who this man is, and here's who his followers are, and this is what they are prone to do, and this is why they are demanding that he be crucified. And, and so maybe he is told that, that we're going to do this to keep the Jews from rioting, and, and you just need to do your job. Don't ask a lot of questions. And so there's no reason to believe that he had any scruples about what he was doing. He's just following orders. He's doing what he was told to do. But he knew that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and that that had infuriated the Jewish elders. He knew that he claimed to be their king, but he certainly doesn't look like a king to them. And so he looks at the claims and he, and he doesn't believe them. To him that Jesus would be no more than a delusional man that, that has crossed the wrong people. But as the soldiers carry out the crucifixion, strange things begin to happen. That centurion is standing there at noon when God turns the lights out. At high noon it goes pitch dark. And it stays that way for three hours. When Jesus died, the Bible says it was a great earthquake. He's standing there when that earthquake takes place. The Bible says that graves are open and people get out of the graves and they begin walking around. So he sees these things happen. Something is not right. Something out of the ordinary is happening before his very eyes. And the Bible says that as that centurion watched the earth tremble, there was another tremor that was taking place in his heart. The Bible says in verse 54 that they feared greatly. They feared greatly. And maybe some of that fear was, what have we done? 
Who have we just crucified? It's not just that they're afraid of an earthquake, but did we do something to anger God? Why, why is the earth quaking because we killed a delusional man? Unless he wasn't a delusional man. This fear, it indicates a conviction. Maybe we have done something wrong in nailing this man to a cross. And it wasn't just conviction, but there was a confession. Look what he says in verse 54. Truly, this was the Son of God. If you'll read Mark's gospel, Mark ties that into the Lord's last statement from the cross. Right before he dies, here's what he says, Father... Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And immediately after, Mark says, this centurion makes this statement. And so this centurion listens to him on the cross, and he knows that this man in his last breath claims God as his father. And when that earthquake happens, the immediate thought is, truly, this man is the son of God. Truly. No doubt in his mind. No equivocation, truly. He remembers those words and, and he's fully convinced that he has just crucified the Son of God. He doesn't know all, know all the theology, but there is fear in his heart for what he has done and he knows that truly this is the Son of God. Now, I won't go so far as to say that this man got saved. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. You can know who Jesus is and not trust in him as your Savior. But there are two components to salvation that are found in this centurion, and that is conviction and confession. You do not get saved until you are convicted of your sin and you are convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have to confess who you are and who he is. Luke 23 and verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw that what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. He confesses that this man is righteous and he is God's son. That centurion represents the response of saving faith. Do you remember when the story of the cross was told you and you understood it? And do you remember when the Holy Spirit began to convict your heart of your sin? And do you remember the day that you finally bowed your head in faith and you trusted Christ as your personal Savior? Do you remember the day when you were both convicted of your sin and you confessed Christ? That's what this centurion did. And I'm grateful this morning I'm thankful this morning for the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal that truth in my heart. It's good to be saved, isn't it? I mean, it is good to know that your sins are forgiven and to know that you're no longer a denier of Christ and you're not a blasphemer of God. And when I read this story, it does something inside of me, even still, because it truly has changed the course of my life. And I just want to thank the Lord for sending the Holy Spirit my way and convicting me that I was a sinner and convincing me of Christ. Thank God for that. There's the response, this centurion's confession. There's a second response, and you've got to go to Luke to look at it. Look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, and look if you would in verse number 48. Same scene. Luke 23 and verse 48, the Bible says, And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. You have the centurion's confession, you have the people's conscience. There's a crowd of people that have stood there and they've watched the crucifixion saga. They've seen everything the centurion's seen. They've heard everything that the centurion has heard. They have seen the earthquake. They have seen the darkness at noon. They have heard the words from, from the cross. They have seen the graves opened up. And, and, and they've known everything. And in their heart, they knew that something was wrong. 
The religious elders have whipped them into a mob. They have blindly followed along, but now they realize that they have been lied to. Something, something is going wrong and, and, and they can't explain it, but they know it. Maybe they began to think back of all the stories of the miracles and the goods that this man has done. Now that they are of a saner mind, they begin to think about the goodness of this man. And maybe all the bad things they were told, maybe that was a lie. Why would all these supernatural things be happening for a man that is just delusional and they are moved greatly? The Bible says that they smote their breasts. It's a sign of anguish. It's a sign of sorrow. It's a sign of grief. It's a sign of remorse. It's a sign of a guilty conscience. What have we done here? There's a sense of overwhelming guilt. They look at that cross. They see that story. And they know there's more to this than what we realize. And they're convicted in their heart. But notice what they do. The Bible says, beholding the things which were done, they smote their breasts and returned. No confession. No calling on God. No response to the conviction. They just went back to what they were doing before. And we're going to wait out the conviction. And hopefully life and busyness will drown it out. And, and we'll get through this. We'll just hold on. They went back to their shops. and went back to their jobs. And they went back to their homes. And they're, they're bothered in their heart. But every day it gets a little bit less and a little bit less. And we we'll just get busy with life. And, and soon that horrible feeling will go away. It's sorrow, but it's not godly sorrow. Because the Bible says that godly sorrow worketh unto repentance unto salvation. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. It is a sorrow that does not produce repentance. It works death is what it does. They're convicted, but that's it. You know, there are people who have stood at the cross and have heard the story and been convicted of their sin, and they stood there sorrowful, smiting their breasts, and they've agonized over their sin, and they've been convicted, and they knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, but hold out till the invitation is over. If I can get home and turn the ball game on, somebody help me a little bit. If I, if I, can, just, if I can get out of this service, if I can get away from this place, if I, if I can just go get something, get something else on my mind, and they return. They went back to life, and they got busy, and they waited for that conviction to die down. And to help drown that noise, they turned to alcohol, turned to drugs, turned to making money, maybe even suicide. They've seen the same evidence that I've seen. They've heard the same story that I've heard. And they felt the same conviction that I have felt. But I tell you, I, there, there are people right now, you could be listening to me right in your home right now. And maybe you're a church person. Maybe you're a religious person. You've read the same story I've read. You've, heard the, you've felt the same conviction I've felt. God has spoken to you just like you've spoken to me. But you're going to do what you've done before. You're going to smite your breast. You're going to feel bad. And you're going to return going to feel bad in your spirit because you know the truth, but you're going to pass by and go on with your life. Listen to the verse, for godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. But the Bible says that the sorrow of the world worketh death. It's a sorrow that does not lead you to get on your knees and to call out to God in despair. I tell you, it is a, it is a sorrow that leads to despair without relief. Turn to alcohol because and it doesn't relieve the pain and you turn to drugs and it doesn't relieve the pain and you turn to money and it doesn't relieve the pain. I tell you, it's killing you is what it's doing. The people's conscience. Come back to Matthew 27. Here's a third response. A centurion's confession. There is a people's conscience. Come back to Matthew 27. Look if you would again in verse number 54 again. Verse 55. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. I call this the women's commitment. A small group of women, they have followed Jesus out to Calvary, and now after it's over, they're still there. 
They have followed afar off. The Bible says, I don't believe because of fear. I think that's as close as they could get. And when all of the disciples have fled, these women are still there. The Bible says that they have followed him from Galilee. Galilee. All the way he was up in Galilee, they've been ministering to him. And when he left Galilee and began to make his way down, they followed him through Perea. They followed him down to Judea. They followed him there to the cross. And now as he hangs there, all of their hopes are crushed. They're still there. They haven't left. It would be obvious to the soldiers, to everybody else standing there, that these women are true believers in Christ. It doesn't seem like they fear the soldiers. It doesn't seem like that they bother by any taunts or any mockings. The strongest emotion in their heart is their love for Jesus. And nothing could overpower that. That's an amazing thing to me. It says they followed him from Galilee. They heard him preaching up there and, and, and they believed in him. They believed that he was the Messiah. So they've cast their lot in with him and they have followed him all the way down. They believe that he is the Messiah. And surely they had so much hope in that day when he rode into Jerusalem and, and everybody was saying, Hosanna to the king, Hosanna to the son of David. Boy, this is it. He's going to be crowned. And now at the foot of the cross, he's dead. And all their hopes with him. But they're still there. Still there. The Bible mentions in verse 56, Mary Magdalene. Mary had been possessed of seven demons, and Jesus had healed her. Mary Magdalene simply means that she was from Magdala, a little town not far from Capernaum. Probably wasn't Mary, probably didn't have children. Mary Magdalene. And then the Bible mentions Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, or Joseph. You remember there were two disciples named James. There was the one that was in the inner three, Peter, James, and John. But there was another James. Sometimes he's called the lesser James or James the less. That is the James that is mentioned here. And here is his mother. Another verse tells us that she's the wife of Cleophas. So you got Mary Magdalene. You got Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Then you have the mother of Zebedee's children. John would tell you that her name was Salome. She's also the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Of course, we know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was at the foot of the cross. So we know of at least at four women. And here's what I want you to think about. That everybody standing around them was hostile to Christ. There are people standing there who have jeered and they mocked and they have laughed as he hung there. There are people standing around there who believe he's a fraud, he's a liar, he's a criminal. There are people standing there who are glad that he's dead. There are people, do you realize, there are people standing there who absolutely hate him. And standing in that hate-filled place are three or four women who have so much love in their heart for him that they will not leave. They are so attracted to Jesus that there is nothing that can drive them away. Isn't that an amazing thing? I wonder if that's you. That no matter what the world says, that no matter what my friends say, that no matter what those on the job say, I still love him. I'll still live for him. I am still going to tell others about him. You cannot mock me enough to make me walk away from him. You cannot threaten me enough to get me to deny him. You cannot bribe me enough with enough of this world to cause me to not serve him. I owe him everything. My life is hid in him. Unwavering, un, un, uh, unwavering, undying commitment, unfaltering devotion. Women's. Women's commitment. What an amazing thing. There's a centurion's confession. There's a people's conscience, women's commitment. Let me show you the fourth one. Look at verse 54. Look at it. Here's the fourth response. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Do you see them? Do you see them there? 
Are, are you looking at your Bible? There's, there's the fourth person. Do you see them there? You don't see them because they're not there. Where's those disciples at? Where are they? I'll tell you where they are. Back chapter 26 and verse 56. Last part. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The disciples cowered us. You, you mean to tell me, Simon Peter, who said, though all men be offended, yet will I not be offended at you? You mean to tell me the sons of thunder who said, let's just call fire down on everybody that doesn't like our preaching? You mean Simon the zealot who wasn't afraid of anything? Where are they at? They're gone. Simon Peter warmed his hands by the enemy's fire, denied the Lord. The Bible says wept bitterly. That's as close as he got. Once Jesus is arrested and taken away, you hear nothing from these disciples. Even John fled. But he came back. He's standing at the cross because Jesus spoke to him from the cross. But the Bible says that at one time they all forsook him and fled. Now, they didn't lose their salvation. They'll be restored. They'll come back. You'll see them in the book of Acts. You'll see them preaching and witnessing and the church expanding. But in this moment, they all fell the Lord. In this moment, in this moment, they would not be named with Jesus Christ. In this moment, what, listen now, in this moment, they would save their lives and their reputation and their safety. We had the kids over at our house last night and we had a good conversation last night about um, what liberties are you willing to give up for security? This coronavirus has opened up a constitutional question about what government authorities can order you to do. Can a mayor or county, county commission tell you that you cannot go to church? Our government, Governor Ron DeSantis, explicitly, explicitly exempted religious gatherings from that executive order. So there is nothing, there is, there's no legal reason why we cannot attend church today. Now, 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 listen carefully. That says nothing about the health risk, all right? I'm not dealing with that. We, we do what we do because of the health risk. I, I'm just talking about legal. And to be honest with you, to be personally, I would not obey an order that says I cannot go to church if it was a legal issue only. I want to be clear. We're having church the way that we're doing. We're practicing social distancing, everything that we can, out of concern for others, our concern for the health risk, all of that. Not because an official says we can't meet, I want to be clear. But can a local magistrate tell you church cannot meet today? Can a sheriff arrest you for not practicing social distancing? Uh, can they forcibly detain you and quarantine you without due process if you insist on not abiding by all the orders that are being passed around? Uh, what liberties are you willing to give up for security? Right? That's a question everybody has to answer. Did you know that there are men who have spilled their blood on a battlefield for the liberties that most Americans don't even recognize? They understood the value of liberty and they were willing to die for it. Give me liberty or give me death. And because they did, I get to live with the freedoms that I enjoy. And there are some men and women who took that same courage and applied it to their faith in Christ and said, we will die before we forsake Christ. We stand with Jesus Christ. There is not a thing that you can say or do to cause me to deny Him. And we come behind those martyrs of the faith and say, give us the same boldness and give us the same courage and give us the same resolve. I don't want to be a cowardly disciple who's hiding behind the tree and give up my right to witness and my right, I, I'm not going to let the world silence me. I want to be able to say, take my life, take my freedom, take my wealth, take it all away, but I stand with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to find me hiding behind a building while some women with more boldness than I have standing at the foot of the cross. Don't let this world cower you into a corner somewhere. What is your response to Calvary? 
You tell the story to the man on the street and you're going to get different responses. Where do you stand tonight? Where do you stand? We haven't been given invitations this morning with the live stream, but I do want to sing an invitational hymn. Anna, I want you to come. And we're going to sing a verse of 155. So if you get your hymnal out, we're going to sing it. As we get ready to sing, I want to ask you a question watching this. Are you saved? Have you ever felt conviction and confessed Jesus Christ? And if somebody was to ask you, why should you go to heaven? Is your answer Jesus Christ? And if your answer is anything but Him, you need to seriously check up. But are you saved? I wonder, I wonder if you're a part of the crowd that has felt conviction, but you returned. I've heard the story. I've felt conviction so many times. But if I can just get away from it. I wonder if this morning, if you get on your knees right now, wherever you are watching this, if you get on your knees right now, and if you'll call out to Christ, He'll save you. Confess your sins to Him and place your faith in Jesus Christ. And He'll do what alcohol can't do. And He'll do what drugs can't do. And what nothing in the world can do for you. He'll do it for you. You belong to a company of loyal women. You're hiding with those cowardly disciples. Coward before your family. Coward before your co-workers. Don't say anything about religion to the great uncle. He doesn't like it. But why don't you gaze at that cross? And why don't you meditate on what that Savior has endured for you and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the courage to take a public stand for Jesus Christ and let everybody in the world around you know that I am a Christian and I am not ashamed of it. Our Heavenly Father, as we sing this verse of number 155, I pray that you'd speak to hearts. Lord, not knowing who's listening and the responses, but you do. Boy, it would be a wonderful thing this morning you'd save somebody sitting in their home watching this. Somebody that says, I, I know he's the son of God. I, I know who he is. And I'm convicted of my sin. I pray there's some Christian, Lord, that been trembling in fear. Not, not fear of the coronavirus, but fear that somebody find out that they're a Christian. I pray that you give us some holy boldness and some courage to gaze at that cross and to realize what you've done for us. So if you were willing to bear shame for me, I'm willing to bear shame for you. Speak to our hearts this morning, I pray. We're going to sing number 155. Number 155, have that own way, Lord. As we sing this, while you're watching this, wherever you're at, I, I challenge you to have a, have a place of an altar. Get on your knees, talk to God. Let God speak to you.